identity, hybridity and diaspora were the ones that I chose and everyday whiteness uh, and how these were applied across the different groups um, of migrants and then just time for questions. So first of all, just a bit about the unit. We talked about with the students relevance of understanding ethnicity and multicultural in Australia. And we looked at it um, from globalisation, migration, and citizenship as, um, aspects, and the main approach is to study ethnicity and migration. So the topics of nationalism were, were covered, and we looked at how that can be very positive thing and how it can turn uh, the ugly at times. And we looked at the wide Australian policy, and that was something that the students were, to my surprise, were really um, taking in and quite shocked about how recent uh, that was still in place. And on feedback from the students, that was one of the things that popped up um, most frequently. The identity of hybridity, transnational, transnational and diaspora were all covered and these concepts looked at the different types of migrants in Australia. And in particular, I had weeks on Muslims, Refugees, which very fortunately fell on the, uh, the week that the documentary on television go back to where you came from was, so the students were encouraged to watch that, which they did. And international students as a new form of contemporary, um, contemporary and temporary migrants, and which is my particular research area, which has been for almost a decade now. And we also looked at Indigenous Australia and multiculturalism. And there wasn't a particular focus on that, but it was just important to tie that into the, into the unit. Um, and we looked at the Indigenous people's views on multiculturalism, which is quite a few surprises for the students. The unit is taught to second and third year sociology students. It was a lecture and a seminar that followed, which included discussions and video clips and which the students really enjoyed. And there was good attendance, which I was hoping was due to um, interest in the topic, but it was also compulsory attendance, which I think might have had something to do with that. <laughs> it was a very diverse group of students. Uh, they, were, they were a group of people who were experiencing ethnicity and multicultures um, on a everyday, in their everyday lives. We talked about what is 
multiculturalism and the differences between assimilation. Because there was often some confusion there with the students. And so that, that was quite interesting because some of them thought multiculturalism was when people assimilated really well. So, you know, there was, there was quite um, a need for the discussion there. And I posed the question with assimilation, should migrants change to become like a larger society in order to promote social cohesion, or should migrants maintain their distinctive cultures, which the group uh, responded to that with some very lively discussion. We looked at citizenship, and this was really interesting in that we did the citizenship and most of us failed. <laughs> Um, the test because it, they, they were questions that people were, they felt weren't particularly relevant to their everyday lives and they were down with the things that they passed that test and become a citizen. To the students, this term, this term citizen was more informally viewed. It was more about being a good citizen, about being part of something. And it was about belonging. The issue of belonging came up quite frequently. And it raised issues of assimilation once again. Guess it's hard to work. Um, it's amazing. I often draw on that, and I was very pleased to hear that um, Tony does too. And um, his notion of insider and outsider relations was very applicable throughout this unit. I've often drawn on his work and have actually used his concept in a paper on the I just wanted to um, read a brief quote from a research project that I did, which was in a small town on the east coast of Australia, I think the Barrier Reef, where there was a new group of migrants coming in. And when asking one of the research participants, uh, you know, what, how do these people fit in, what can we do to, to become part of this? And they said, well, to be a citizen, you have to join the club, join the bowls club, or in the tennis club, the social aspect has got to be the quickest way to become part of the community. It's not so much the work, it's the social aspect that's the most important. Then they get the idea. So you might be down the pub and they'll say, oh, that's, you know, and you know, this um, Chinese name, Mao Zedong. He's a member of our dance club, and that can be a real icebreaker. So that was the sort of things that some Australians were using as that's how you become a citizen, is that how you become a part of the community, which I found pretty amazing. We looked at identity, and this was something that the students really picked up on. They, they hadn't really thought about their own identity. <coughs> and I used Ford's work to um, situate identity at the interface between self and society. It was a, a topic that the students were really most willing to talk on. I had three students actually volunteer to speak to the class, which is pretty amazing. And they wanted to talk about their cultural backgrounds and how they form their identity and what, that, what the concept had made them sort of think about who they were. We talked about the conflict demands on identity and probably the most um, I, uh, person that I had, the person that I had that was you know, really wanting to talk about this was an Egyptian student who had described herself as an Aussie Bogan. <laughs> uh, she, and and how she, when she went home, she fitted into this very different life that then, and her family didn't understand why she wanted to go, using her term, go to the pub with her Aussie friends. So she was living in this very different life and this really with a lot of a lot of the experiences of the students and how they they sort of negotiated their way uh, through these different demands on their identity, and they enjoyed the fact that they could have they could have more than one identity. So we just talked about the different influences and about how, how people often question their identity when, when they are experiencing these different multicultural backgrounds. 
and it also led to a discussion about new or cultural racism where people are judged about their different cultural practices as opposed to their physical attributes such as their colour. scholars are arguing that it's more useful to study how the term is used and who is using that. And the negative connotations that have been applied to it were 19th century actually discussions shaped by racist, racist assumptions. But we talked about it in terms of lots of other things that happen to people who are hybrids as in slavers and cars these days. Um, so, but the argument um, has been said to be difficult to sustain. But it was interesting, the students actually quite liked that and started describing themselves as a hybrid. So it was, it was just a new sociological concept to them to describe something that they actually experience in their everyday lives. And the notion is much more these days acceptable in terms of language, about double accent of language, three different influences on their accent and it's very hard to pick where some people's backgrounds might be. So it, that's where it's more likely applied. <coughs> they really like sort of extreme examples and this is a one in a million chance. Both a young couple, both of um, mixed race and they had twins, uh, one white and one black. And uh, I think the students enjoyed the kids. Yes. Good. So um, this was how this was presented. It's important to picture. And of course, the parents uh, made a comment. Um, it was a shock to realise my twins were two different colours. So Kylie, the mother, who was only 19, but it doesn't matter to us. They just have two. Diasporas were also of great interest to students because many of them were living as part of the diaspora but they didn't realise it. It hadn't been discussed in their families as of that because that, that was just normality to them. And they realised that some of them lived in Caulfield, were part of the Jewish diaspora, some of them lived in Springvale, which had sort of become part of the Vietnamese diaspora. Where the new is compensated by the familiar. And so it was discussed in terms of uh, positive and sometimes negative aspects of it, about these transport, communications, those sorts of things. <coughs> but also about how they acquire a new national identity, even though they have lots of community within a larger community. And the processes were thought to be bound, um, bound to cause internal dilemmas and create tensions. And again, this is where. Um, Gassantage work came in very handy here in discussing those insider outsider relations where he talks about one has to be on the inside. You can be an outsider, you can be an outsider on the inside, you can really see what's going on. We talked about the origins of the word, seeing it was pretty new to most of them and how people had a loyalty to their diaspora group. And there were attempts to remain distinct from others. So I was thought they were less likely to, um, to assimilate, but at the same time to uh, form a relationship with the former community as well. We looked at a number of uh, <coughs> um, across the world with different patterns. And I'll just 
just included one here today because it was just a very bright, sort of colourful one and it really showed um, <coughs> what the idea was about. Everyday whiteness was something that they had thought about and something a lot of us don't think about. We talked about white privilege and this was a little bit confronting. And I used a clip, which has some very bad language in it. At the time I was cringing, the students weren't, they weren't really much used to the sort of language that was used in that much more than I am. But it talks about uh, the benefits of whiteness. And C.K. Lewis uses this and he explores in his ability to travel to any period of time in history to know that regardless of the era, he would be advantaged. He examines the potential disadvantage of uh, future retribution. And I like to use this clip to introduce the concept of white privilege to students through the use of comedy, a particularly useful approach given many students' initial resistance to this concept, especially the white students. And it was about, uh, it talks about us not understanding sometimes why we are uh, privileged and end up in situations that we don't understand why. And I think probably it hit home to me when I was in America last year, when I was in a situation and in a sociology conference and I walked into a room where there was a, a hip hop show being um, screened. <coughs> My daughter actually was a hip hop teacher and I was very interested in that. She's a, a very quite but I was interested in this, so I walked in there, and the room was full for coloured people. There was one other white person who also had to be a sort of strain. And I sat there, and I was made to feel very uncomfortable, and I was not welcome in that room. And this is not something that I'm accustomed to. <laughs> and I feel a bit reluctant in a sense talking about it, because I think how can a white, middle-aged, privileged woman be whinging about feeling a bit uncomfortable in the room? <laughs> But it was, uh, it was confronting in a sense, and it made me really think about why am I being treated like this? I'm interested in these people, I'm interested in their work. Um, they should be happy for me, you know. uh, But clearly they weren't. And it was something that made me think about this issue of white privilege. And so, and, and the students were quite interested in, in this concept as well. So um, it was a good opportunity to introduce this to me. Just a bit of information there on the on the Bosnians, how they were considered a refugee elite, and they were gracefully accepted. And Charlie Pisk was in daily contact with the Pisk and the Bosnian Bosnians, first as an interpreter and then a researcher. So she pretty much had an inside view there as well. But it was this quote in her paper 
that really captures what she was talking about. And she writes, one day a mature lady entered my cab in South Perth. I always call black and white taxis because in small taxis they're all strangers, Arabs, whoever. You cannot talk to them, they speak poor English. I said, well, my English is not the best either. She gave me a look sideways and said, at least you're the right colour. Oh, <laughs> this was not very long ago that this was written. So, you know, even though we've sort of moved on, we're probably in an era of more cultural racism rather than colour racism. Now, it's still existing in some communities. She took South Africa. <laughs> 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 I support the Howard government, but you guys are all right, which is such a difficult thing to hear. And, and I was, you know, 17 and year 12 and angry about that. And, and my dad was always saying, you need to bite your tongue because these people are supporting us. You just need to take it. <laughs> I'd uh, just like to sort of say something from the uh, other, of the flip side, if you like, as a member of the Scottish diaspora, as it were. Uh, and that is the assumed shared racism in a very exclusively anti-Celtic company and can often be fairly intimidated about speaking out against racist assumptions because, you know, look at me, I'm anti-Celtic and all the rest of it and I've gone two generations back and live in the country, therefore it's assumed I'm automatically racist like everyone else. And you can be quite, and in some situations, social situations you feel under quite intense pressure not to say that that sort of power deal of stuff is wrong. So it's, it's a play. I think I'm actually really lucky because of my family situation and I'm so aware of that. I'm in a position that whenever I can, you know, maybe that, I, I get the chance to say to my kids at school and I get to say to people, oh, actually that's really wrong, I don't care what colour I am. Like, and you're right, maybe it is quite difficult. Because they don't feel like they should. And that somehow racism is okay if someone else isn't there. You know, do you know what I mean? Which is even more pernicious. 
Um, Um, thank you for showing a photo of one of my best friends, actually, Dr. Masha Lasica, the lady you had from the Bosnian, Serbian, Bosnian community. She's actually back in Melbourne, and um, she was uh, one of the top medical students of Australia last year. Now she's um, finishing on oncology, so she'll be an oncologist soon. Um, what I wanted to um, raise is also an issue of racism uh, within migrant communities against others. I mean, I myself an Australian migrant, and it's, it is absolutely staggering when you hear other migrants being more racist than anyone else. Um, and that's an issue which probably wasn't highlighted here um, much, uh, but Dr. Chorlich actually did say that in, in her quote. So for example, a lot of migrants from, from Europe, all migrants, are very, very racist towards migrants from Asia, Africa, and also a lot of migrants from the Middle East. And, racist towards migrants from other countries. So can we get some commentary on how much research is being done on that in Australia? And yes. is it different from other types of studies of racism in Australia? Yes, I think. Um, basically, it wasn't sort of presented to me because I wasn't presenting it in much more course than I teach. But in my own research, I'm finding a lot of exactly what you're uh, explaining even from the international student community. Um, also, in um, there's been work being done showing that um, old groups of um, established migrants are very reluctant to accept the newer groups coming in. I see some kids nodding. Um, and uh, yeah, I've, I have really come across a lot of that myself. There's, uh, I've, I've actually got work that's um, under review at the moment in relation to international students that indicates it's I'm actually from South Africa, and when I, I migrated here in 1973, we had to first appear at the embassy in person so they could see we were white. We didn't, they didn't say that, but they said, we will do nothing over the phone. You must come and see us. And my friends go and say, this is what will happen. And then when I did arrive here, I said, oh, you're from South Africa, therefore you are racist. I'm not. If I were racist, I would have stayed. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, in that yes. It's really interesting that um, people are going you know, to come out and express these views. And I think sometimes even white people actually don't have to express those views that they've experienced and things like that because it seems to be um, something I just wanted to let people know, if you want to actually follow um, uh, uh, just a contemporary, just over the last week, um, it's a hashtag on Twitter called Racist Like a Fox, and it's what are you targeting together as just one, one word, Racist Like a Fox. And it's a lot of people from within Australia and outside Australia sharing their experiences about um, entrenched racism and what things people have said to them. But if you follow the thread, it's actually quite interesting because a lot of people who are not um, uh, of ethnic minorities background that are contributing to that conversation and the horror, especially from a lot of males, white males, is quite it's quite an interesting thread to follow. So we've got to draw a curve. You might want to follow that with your kids or um, when you get back to school. Um, being in uh, Northern Victoria, we um, are fairly monocultural, and at a, from a school perspective, often we find students challenging our teaching, particularly of Indigenous um, studies. So the response to that is we have enshrined essentially in our policy documentation an Indigenous perspective that prioritises an Indigenous perspective across the school. And you come to St Mary's knowing that that's our position. If you don't like it, don't come. That's really helpful as a way of legitimising a personal viewpoint. You say it's enshrined in what we do as a school culture. So just to follow up on that question in a second, but pardon me, but um, one of the points you flashed up on, on, on the slideshow, I guess you expressed past it to compress your course into 20 minutes, was the, was the idea of Indigenous perspectives on multiculturalism. Could you talk to that for a little while, please? Yes, yeah, so we didn't focus particularly on Indigenous um, study because we didn't actually focus on that. And it's an area that if you don't know an awful lot about it, or if you're not indigenous yourself, it's not a question. So um, 
what I looked at was the news, and there, there was a couple of papers in there which were covered in white at the top of my head. And it looked about um, Indigenous people's views on multiculturalism. And it was surprising that they were very accepting of people of different backgrounds. And also, there was a paper written on, I can think of the information passed on to you later, on um, the influence of Islam on Aboriginals and how a number of, quite a number of Aboriginal people identify with Islam and it's related to the influence of early traders. And so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was quite an amazing piece of work and something that just sort of doesn't really get acknowledged. And I wanted it to be something different to just looking at the Indigenous situation in Australia. So it, it was about that multicultural influence and, and how the Indigenous population's views um, are certainly uh, quite open to working towards multiculturalism, which I was surprised with. Um, I was interested in your um, finding that a number of migrants were confused about the meaning of multiculturalism, and it's been, you know, since the seventies and now, but still, this confusion and debate changes. Of course, um, there's been a critique on the left that this this arm would have this that is it a form of multiculturalism sexualised and froze ethnic identity. And of you know, a particular group, you know, tried to manage it in a governmental way and say Greeks are like this, Italians are like that. And of course, people defy and change and hybridise to use that word. And it, the, I think he said the multicultural deal is really hard for government to keep up with. And because most of the people are making these decisions, for many don't come from. Um, Various non Anglo Saxon, Anglo Celtic groups. They aren't really, I've been on the impression when I worked in the ABC, for example, they didn't really care. They just said, oh, yeah, that's a Greek. They played with stereotypes. And I wonder if you think, from a policy point of view, we now need to make a leap into a new kind of, you know, <coughs> kind of multicultural, but seeing the word is being out it's almost a tradition. <coughs> or a new word policy that represents the way we actually live. I actually agree wholeheartedly with um, a need to move on from that, not to um, get rid of the idea of accepting other cultures, but I do feel like it's a bit of old school. Um, and that it, it gets people to back up when you raise the issue of this, you know, the, oh, you're dumping multiculturalism, does that mean we're not, not, not a white racist society and we're not going to accept that? But I think we need to be more mature about that and, and move on because there is this confusion about the issue. There's this, um, I just recently had an on student complete um, a project on the law of the Muslim science of the youth, and she wanted to talk about multiculturalism. social cohesion because isn't that that melding all things together and multiculturalism that speaks to that and they're just maintaining the cultures. So I do think that there is um, that it is time to move on, whether everybody's ready to do it or not is a big question. But even sometimes in discussions I've heard people get upset about the notion of using cosmopolitanism. So it, it's sort of a, a very ongoing Debate, and um, I sort of feel that I would be at the point of um, I would probably like to remain my unit a little bit, but I'll sort of I'm just biding my time and uh, take it easy because I, I just sort of feel it's not about changing the content of it, it's just about resituating it in, in a more appropriate, I think, terminology for, for this day. Yeah, so thanks. One more question. Yeah. In Russia, on the Russian passport of every Russian, it will say it's Russian German, Russian Tatar, Russian Khan. And that is a weakness, I see. I mean, it's suited Stalin to have been categorized 
But I mean, hardly anybody knows of the German forebears of Lenin. I mean, you are mixed, everybody is mixed. There are grades to which people have been hybridized. Uh, my mother was convinced, that this was in Germany, Germany, convinced that a white person couldn't have a child for that matter. Now, I'm going to have a child, a grandchild, in June. My daughter is blonde and tall, and she married a Goan, a Portuguese Goan born in Kenya. <laughs> he is, he is, his faithful expressions are European. He has a darker skin, of course. So now, of course, I'm thinking of Mendel's laws and wonder what sort of a mix it is. But we are all back, and it will be invisible, of course. In my back, my grand, great grandfather was Russian. I was born in England. I was educated in Germany. My mother was born in Berlin. So what am I? And it was, I had great fun when I applied for Australian public service because only my father was born in Germany. My brother had his marriage to an American girl and so on. So it comes back to it. Are you an honest person or not? Irrespective of what color and what cultural package. And that needs to be appreciated and that is part of the culture. It's not what was Germany in 1910 or what was Scotland in 1950. 